Good evening, everyone. My name is Takiwa Smith. I'm founder and executive director of Science Engineering Mathematics Link Incorporated. And I want to welcome you to our Math and Science Career Academy Teen Science Cafe. The purpose of the Teen Science Cafe is to provide teens with the opportunity to meet members of the STEM community and learn about STEM careers while you're at a critical time in your K through educational experience. If you're in middle school, you are thinking about what classes you wanna take in high school. And if you wanna to go to a special magnet school or be participate in certain STEM clubs. And if you're in high school, meeting these STEM professionals help you decide what you wanna major in in college. And so we are excited because this is the last cafe of the 2021 program year. We are going to take a hiatus for the summer. Um, at the end of the cafe, our program coordinator, Carlin, will tell you what we're going to do this summer. And so we're excited about the cafe and what you will learn from today's speaker. He's doing some pretty cool stuff that I think you all will really enjoy and learn a lot. So I'm going to turn it over to our program coordinator, Carlin Pounders, who is going to introduce the cafe speaker. You're on mute, Carlin. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are so excited to have this last Teen Science Cafe, as Tequila shared. Um, you know, our first Teen Science Cafe was amazing. And I really think that we are about to end on um, another high note. And so for today's um, session, we have Dr. Olu Shaney Kamalafe um, as our speaker. He is on a mission to increase the access of people with limb loss or limb difference to devices that improve their quality of life. He is the co-founder and CEO of OYS Mobility Incorporated, a technology startup developing software to digitize the design and manufacture of custom fitted prosthetic devices for people with limb loss. He has a PhD in biomedical engineering and an academic research background developing computational models of soft tissues. Before starting OYS Mobility, he worked in product development and commercialization of medical devices and high-tech consumer electronics. Sounds pretty cool, right? When not working, he enjoys playing sports, music, and kicking back with family and friends. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Kamalafe if he is ready. Thank you, Carlin. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to Kiwi as well for the invite. I'm very excited to be here and very excited to present. Um, I will start by just checking in to make sure that everyone can see my screen. So I'm going to go full screen now. So can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Awesome. Okay, so I'm excited for this talk. Um, I will say that the format is going to hopefully be um, conversational. So I will present some information but I'd love to get a lot of questions and, you know, we can go in a lot of details in the question and answer session. So I would start by giving an overview so that, you know, you can walk away from the talk, having some at least baseline understanding of the work I do, the career path I took. Um, but it's really in the question and answer session that I hope we can go into a lot of details. So if you have any questions, please write them down. And at the end of the talk, we'll reserve enough time to kind of go in detail on the questions. Okay, so a little about me. Um, I was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. So I grew up in Nigeria until I was 15. I went to school there, lived there, and then came to the US um, when I was 15 and I was in high school here. So I, I came right into the 11th grade. Um, it was really exciting. I think my time in Nigeria is something I look back on with a lot of fond memories. Um, you know, I had two older siblings you know, I inherited a lot of toys, especially a lot of broken toys, and a lot of my engagement with, you know, what I now understand to be STEM, or specifically engineering, was usually trying to repair toys that were broken, 
Um, I was also very interested in how things work and ended up taking apart a lot of things, you know, just to really see what's going on on the inside. And in fact, now I think about engineering as, you know, the culmination of that interest where when I was much younger, I took things apart and engineering was really what taught me how to put things back together. So um, I came to the U.S. after high school. I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and I did a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering. Um, it was really interesting. The way I describe UMBC is that we don't have a football team, but we have the number one chess team in the country. So there was a lot of very interesting people who had similar interests as I did in understanding how things worked, um, just really trying to get to, you know, first principles of technology, of, you know, devices. Um, while I was there, I played rugby. I worked at Res Life. I was part of the African Students Association, worked with Habitat for Humanity, did a lot of activities that, you know, just really helped me get a very rounded education. So, um, you know, I would hope that maybe in some of the questions we can talk about some of the other options for activities that we can do during school. Um, after um, undergrad, I was very interested in medicine and, you know, thought that biomedical engineering was a good way to bridge the gap between, you know, medical education and an engineering education. So I ended up going in for biomedical engineering. I ended up with a PhD, but initially I was just going for a master's. I thought I'll just see how it goes for a couple of years. If I like it, I'll stay. If I don't, I'll leave. But it ended up being really, really cool. And I had a lot of fun. Um, while I was there, I was on the cycling team, you know, worked for the school paper as a photographer, you know, was part of the graduate student government as a secretary, just did a lot of things that I thought were interesting. And all those things really added to the experience that I had in school. Um, after my PhD, I was, you know, I was not really so sure what I wanted to do next, but I knew I had a lot of interest and you know, for anyone who knows me consistently, there are just so many things that I like to do. And, you know, I figure that, well, you know, I'm going to try to do what's called a postdoc. And a postdoc is really, you know, for people with a PhD, it's an opportunity to learn a little bit more about what a career path with a PhD um, feels like. Um, especially if you're thinking of going into academia to become faculty or become a professor. Um, so I got it, I applied for a program at Northwestern University. I got in and I started a postdoctoral research um, fellowship. And this was a two year program. And there is really where I started getting exposed to prosthetics. You know, so my PhD was very general in the sense of I knew I was working on the human body as a biomedical scientist or biomedical engineer. But the postdoc is really where I started to specialize in prosthetics and think about how, you know, I can design prosthetic devices, analyze prosthetic devices using other computational techniques. Um, so I had, so you'd notice people who are paying attention between the end of my postdoc in September 2013 and then the start of my first job in the U.S., which was in October 2014. There was about a year gap. And in that year, I was just so burnt out from school. I was like, I'm going to take a break. And I ended up going in as a consultant, so a management consultant. So I did that for a year. But I came back to the U.S. I was working in medical technology with a company called Med and Steel. Um, in the interest of time, I would actually skip over some of the details on my work experience um, because I think a lot of the interest from the audience would be, you know, my academic experience. So please ask a bunch of questions on details about the, the academic experience. Um, after Med and Steel, I'll just gloss over this. I worked at Facebook for a while. Um, this was actually really cool. I worked at their Oculus hardware research group and we were developing um, you know, virtual reality and augmented reality technology. It was just really fun. I was there for about a year and a half approximately. And it was just a really amazing time, you know, developing essentially the future of technology. Um, so after my time at Facebook, you know, I just really wanted to do things like solve problems that I cared about deeply. And I took about three, four months off where I just interviewed different people, talked to different people. I'd always been interested in prosthetics, as I mentioned from my postdoc, but I had never really 
consider that as an actual career. Um, but in those three, four months, I talked to a bunch of people and understood some of what the detailed problems were. And the combination of that was I ended up starting a company. It's called OIS or OIS Mobility. And I started that company in 2020 in February, right when the pandemic hit. So that was a very interesting time to be starting a business. But, you know, it's been going on for just a little under a year and a half so far. Um, so to kind of move on to the talk, what I'll do is talk about an engineering framework that summarizes how I think about engineering and how engineering is typically taught and communicated. Um, I like to say, and I deeply believe that engineering at its core is a very humanist um, discipline. You know, you have to engage with the people that you're solving problems for. Now, what engineering does is that it just offers you a very structured, and I use the word structured, efficient, and repeatable process for solving problems. So if, just to give an example, you know, if you're trying to solve something and, you know, you throw a dart at, at a solution and just try something and it works, it's like, yes, that's great. It worked. Um, but it's still not engineering. It's not until it's structured, efficient, and repeatable that then it becomes engineering. You know, the idea of engineering is that you want to be able to consistently solve problems the best way possible. So I've summarized it into these four categories. And the first is observation. Um, in this phase, what you're trying to do is to understand the problems that the user is facing. You say, what, what's the experience? You know, the, the word that we use in engineering or in design thinking is empathy. You have empathy for the user. So you try to embody the experience that the user is having, and that's the observation phase. The next phase is then design. And, you know, the way I think about design is that you're coming up with a solution that you don't really know is going to work. So it's really more a, a hypothesis than a factual solution. At this point, you think that, you know, your idea might solve the problem, but you don't really know. You just have an informed hypothesis. The next step is then when you test your hypotheses. So this is really where you say, okay, I have a good understanding of the problem from my observations. I have a good hypothesis of what the solution is. I need to test that. I need to check to see if that's true. And the final step in this four step framework is that you then evaluate your solution. You ask questions like how well did my solution or my hypotheses solve the problem? How fast did it solve the problem? How cheaply did it solve the problem? Is it cheaper or more expensive than the alternative on the market? So really this is the framework and this is also the flow. Now this is a very theoretical framework. The reality is that the reality is that it's more like this. So, you know, sometimes you're in the design step and then you go back to the observation. Sometimes you proceed all the way from observation to the testing step and then you're like, oh, I made a mistake or I missed something. So it's very iterative in that sense. Um, recursive is another word that sometimes people use to describe the overall engineering process. Okay, so now that we understand the framework, we're going to go through an activity and I have a challenge for everyone. So everyone, please bring out your phones and open up the texting application of your choice. Um, so I'll give you a second to do that. What we're going to do is type this phrase, potential through exposure. And the challenge is that we're going to type it with our elbows. So everyone's going to type it with your elbows and let me just, Check in with Carlin. Carlin, is there any way for people to comment or or speak? Is that is that possible? Um, they can't uh, speak. Okay. However, they they can comment. Okay. Um, and I'm actually managing the the comments in the chat, so I'll be able to um, relay to okay. you uh, responses. Perfect. Okay. So what we'll do is everyone would try to text this phrase, potential through exposure, and you text with your elbows, right? So that's the goal. You open up your text app, you text with your elbows. Um, I would run a timer for 30 seconds. 
Um, I did a test for myself and I could do this in about six seconds with my two thumbs. So 30 seconds is a lot more, a lot, a lot, a lot more time, right? So text with your elbows and when you're done with that, just put whatever you typed, put that into the, into the, into the chart. And then Carling, maybe you can just read out a couple of what people say. Okay. So we're starting now. Okay, time's up. So let's see how far everyone got. So Carlin, if anyone texted anything in the chat, let's just read out loud what they have. This is where I really wish I could see everyone so I could just call call them people's names. So I'll tell you about my experiences while people are typing in the in the in the chat box. Um for me I was uh, a couple of things actually I was actually surprised how well I did. Um I never made it through the whole phrase, but you know, a lot of times I like I was trying to type a p and I actually did type a p. Um you know, I, I never successfully made a phrase like potential, for example, that was too difficult to type. Um, Carlin, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. So right. someone said they only got as far as potential to EXP. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's really and, good. I know. And someone's else said um i they might have been able to chat it or not chat it type it i don't know they said i'll i'll double check but okay i can say i didn't get anything close to potential i kept getting like a series of l's <laughs> And I'm just like, what? These are no words. Yeah. No one can do this, really. How can they do this? <laughs> okay, so the next the next step is actually going to be a little interactive as well. So just follow the same model. Um, just type the responses into the chat box as well. Um, so I really want a discussion of what the problems were. So what? Like what exactly made it hard to successfully type the phrase? And this is also a bit of brainstorming. So really there's no answer that's a bad answer. So just, you know, just be very free with the ideas that you, you share. So someone said um, one of the problems that they experienced was that elbows are way too wide to type on a keyboard. That's fair. So one of the ways you categorize that is that it's an interaction problem. So, I mean, one lens is that the elbows were too wide. The other lens is that the key or the, the text you know, the letters were too small, right? But it's really because it's an interaction between the elbow and the keyboard. So smaller elbows would work, but also larger, um, larger, larger keys or larger text would work. Were there any other problems that people had? Um, the other one 
I believe speaks to what you just said. Um, they said the problem was that keyboards on phones are designed to be used by fingers. Mm -hmm. So if you can't use those, it's really difficult. Totally. Okay. Um, I also think with the touch screen, like maybe it would have been easier, like old phones where you actually had keys itself, but mm -hmm. like you could be touching anything with a touch screen keyboard. Agreed. So I, I remember when everyone switched from the BlackBerry to the iPhone, I remember there were a couple of people, my parents included, who said, I'm never going to switch. I love the BlackBerry because it has a physical keys. They're actual, you get the tactile response of touching a key versus, you know, just the vibration of hitting a screen. So that, that's a, that's a good one. Okay, so we can we can always double back as well, but we'll move on and say, you know, this is really where we put on our creative hats and ask and answer the question, how can we make the experience better? Um, I'm going to take away the obvious one, which is to have bigger keys or bigger keyboards. Are there any other ideas that people have for making the experience of texting with your elbow better? Someone said designing a pointer to attach to the elbow. I like that. <laughs> I like that too. And I really like that because it solves the interaction problem. I mean, it might create other problems, but it certainly solves the problem of the relative size of the elbow compared to the screen. Right. So if the problem is that the elbow is too big or the screen's too small, then we now have this interface device that allows us to more precisely make contact. Right. So that's a really cool solution. Are there any other solutions? Yep. Someone said making the experience making the experience better might include something tactile, like a kind of braille on the keys, mm -hmm. so you know what the letters are by just feeling them. Mm. Cool. That's a good one. It is. So that's like decreasing the error rate. So now instead of just randomly putting your elbow in a position in the screen and maybe using like a visual cue, you increase the sensation that the receiver or the user gets. And now you have some tactile interface or tactile experience. So that's really good. Those are all. Oh. OK, OK. So. You know, the, the goal of this exercise was to highlight, you know, with a, with a very real life example, how engineering works. The narrative is that when we talk about the problems, we're doing something or we're going through a process that is called problem definition. And this is really where you just, you just look at the problem and try to come up with as many ways as you can to describe the problem. And the reason you do that is because whatever your solution is, the requirements of your solution are connected to how well you understand the problem. So the first step in any design process is really to engage with the problem. And that's exactly what we just did, right? So the one about the size of the elbow or the size of the keyboard, you know, those were all relations to the problem, part of the problem definition. The next step is to now say that, okay, how can we make the experience better? Well, this is really talking about what solutions can we offer in the sense of product design, right? So, you know, how do we design a better experience for the user? Everything is always user centric, right? So the understanding of the problem is really what is the problem of the user? The understanding of the experience in terms of the solution is really what's the, what, what makes the experience better for the for the user. Now, what I'm offering here is really just that engineering is the connection between having a problem, a well-defined problem, and having a well-articulated or well-implemented solution. So engineering is this set of tools 
that you can walk around the world with on how you solve problems, how you solve technical problems, certainly. Um, but that's what engineering is. So the reason you go through the STEM curriculum in school, you know, the reason you take, you know, statics or physics or mechanics of materials is really just so that when you encounter a problem, you're able to understand, okay, what's the appropriate tool to solve that problem? So that's the engineering process. So now that we know that, I'll kind of introduce what I do specifically and the work, the work that I do. So I work, like I mentioned previously, on prosthetic design. Um, so especially prosthetic limb design. Um, in general, you know, with the limb, you have your upper limb, which are your arms and your hands, and then your lower limbs, which are your legs. A lot of times when people have either an amputation of their limb, um, so they might have lost a portion of their limb, or when they have something called limb difference, you know, they might actually be missing a portion of their limb. In some cases, people are missing you know, the bone between their elbow and their wrist. And they just were born that way. They just, you know, their hand is directly attached to their elbow. They're missing, missing that bone or they're missing the bone between their knee and their, and their ankle. You know, their foot is directly pretty much attached to the knit, to the, to the knee. So these are congenital, um, you know, medical cases that, you know, people have. And in that case, you can design a prosthetic limb. So I'll just repeat what I said in a more um, clear way, hopefully. There are two reasons you need a prosthetic limb. One reason is that you lost your limb through, you know, it could be an accident, you know, it could be a vascular condition, like some people lose their limbs because of diabetes. Um, the other reason you'd use a prosthetic limb is because you were born with a congenital medical um issue where where you had a missing bone, for example. So what my company does is we design prosthetic sockets. And like it says here, prosthetic sockets are really what it what the, what create an inner face between the person's body or the portion of their body that's remaining, the portion of their limb that's remaining, and the prosthetic limb. So you can imagine in the image on the right, that a person who has lost a portion of their leg would fit their leg into the socket. And that's really how you get that attachment. So what I'll do now is I would show you a video um, on how prosthetic devices are made. And I might have to call for some help. Okay, yay, it looks like it should work. So we are here. Okay, so Carlin, just please confirm if you can see the screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so it's a two minute video. It goes really, really fast. So you might not understand every single detail, but really just the goal is to just get a high level understanding of how a prosthetic socket, remember a prosthetic socket is the interface between the user and the device on how a prosthetic socket is made. So here goes. Despite billions of dollars being poured into R&D for advanced bionics and smart joints, prosthetic socket manufacturing has undergone little advancement. Building a lower extremity socket is a labor-intensive process requiring highly skilled practitioners, technicians, complex labs, and the use of toxic materials. This process has not seen a transformative upgrade in over 50 years. The steps involved in creating a socket include taking measurements and a plaster cast of the residual limb. From that, a positive model is created and the practitioner carves out and sculpts the model for desired tension values. Next, a check socket is created by vacuum forming molten plastic over the model. These steps include trimming excess material, breaking the plaster, grinding and smoothing the socket, and finally, assembly. We are then ready for patient fitting and alignment. The check socket may need to be adjusted multiple times before the correct fit is achieved. 
When the patient is satisfied with the fit and comfort, we go to the final step, lamination. Another plaster model is created from the check socket. Multiple layers of composite materials are layered over it. The model is sealed and impregnated with resin and given time to cure. Then the socket is finalized by cutting, drilling, breaking, trimming, grinding, smoothing, assembly, and aligning. Another patient visit and the socket is complete. Okay, so maybe we can just discuss this for a second. Um, I should turn that off. Okay, um, so are there any comments, any thoughts about what we just saw? So maybe I'll ask a specific question first. Um, how many people kind of knew about prosthesis or prosthetic devices or have someone in their family who uses a prosthetic device or use a prosthetic device themselves? How many people are knowledgeable or have some information about the use of prosthetic devices in general? So we do have some comments. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to type. <laughs> uh, let's see. So someone said that, um, you know, the idea of limb loss is eye opening. Mm -hmm. um, someone else said that they knew that people could be born with limb loss, but didn't realize you could be born with your foot where your knee would be, or that your hand could be where your elbow would be. Ooh, I didn't, I don't think I knew that either. Mm -hmm. um, Someone said they honestly don't know anything about prosthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I think unless you have someone in your family or unless you know you're a user of a prosthetic device yourself, they're just very there's just very little information available for a lot of people. It's not something that many of us interact or encounter in our everyday life. Um so let me go back to the presentation. And we just have a few. I see someone said her brother has one as well. Um, they said that uh, they have a family member who has limb loss from an incident. Mm. Okay. So, okay. So this slide just summarizes, you know, what we saw in the video and you know, the summary is really that the design of prosthetic devices are very manual. Um, you know, the hands are the hands of a provider, a clinical provider. Um, the limb, in this case, is the limb of a person that's getting a prosthetic device fitted. Um, and as you can see, for a prosthetic device to be manufactured, the provider has to be, I mean, I mean, sorry, the the user of the prosthetic device has to have direct access to the provider. So for our company, that's the problem we're solving. We're really trying to identify other ways to provide prosthetic devices without this requirement that the user and the provider are in the same place, right? So some kind of way of abstracting that away. So let's go back to the engineering framework that we discussed. Again, it's observation, design, test, and evaluate. And like I said earlier, it's not a linear flow, right? So it doesn't always go from observation to design and then to test. Sometimes from test, you go all the way back to observation and so on and so forth. But the goal here is let's apply this same framework to what we just saw in the video and in the image that I just showed. So on the problem side, the observation is that access to prosthetic healthcare is expensive. It's also it's that it's manual, right? It's difficult to access for many people. So imagine if you have an amputation, you have to travel to the hospital, travel to the clinic or the facility. It takes a long time. I don't know if anyone remembers from the video, it could take about four visits to the provider 
and then it could take as long as 40 hours to manufacture each individual device. Um, a lot of times the process is quite uncomfortable. It's really messy. So you have all this plaster on your body and, you know, it's really quite a messy process. Now, the hypotheses that our company is making is that the experience of the user would be better if they have a digital solution, right? If the, if the solution is scalable and mobile, if it's environmentally sustainable, so one of the comments in the video was that they use a lot of toxic chemicals, which is a fact. Um, we feel the solution would be, or the experience would be better if it's easy to use, both for the provider and the user as well. And then if it's accurate, if you get a comfortable device that actually fits your prosthetic, your prosthetic needs. Now on the test and the experiment side, what we're doing to to, to, to test our hypotheses, we're doing three things. One is a computer simulation. So in this case, people, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the students take computer-aided design. So AutoCAD, Pro-E, SolidWorks, all these different tools. So we're using SolidWorks and other um, CAD tools to test our designs and see whether it works. Does it fit? Is it the right size? Is it easy to manufacture? The next level of our test is benchtop testing. This is where we essentially do compression tests to figure out what's the structural strength of whatever we make, of the product we make. And then the last step in the test would now be clinical testing. And this is where we get people with limb loss and ask them to try our devices and then give us feedback. So those are the three different tests we're using. Now on the analysis stage, or the evaluate stage, we're asking a bunch of questions. We're asking, are, are the solutions we offer, are they higher quality than what's, what exists today? Is it easier to use? And when I ask easier to use, is it easier to use for the provider? And is it easier to use for the, the user as well, the end user of the device? Is it more affordable? Is it cheaper, right? Do they get a higher quality for the price? Um, is it a faster service? Instead of taking 40 hours to manufacture, are there ways we can do this in less time? Instead of taking four or five visits, are there ways you can do it in one time, like one visit and you're done? And then is it environmentally friendly as well? So the goal of this was to use the framework that we had discussed in a real life case. And this is actually what we do in, 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 in my company. This is, this is how we think through the process and how we think through the problem we're solving. So. This is the last slide and it just shows you, it's just a snapshot of, you know, the technology that we're, we're, we're developing. We talked about the access. We're trying to solve the access problem with a digital solution. So what we're doing is developing an app where a clinician or an operator can scan the residual limb of a person who needs a prosthetic device. So this replaces the plaster. So you remember how messy the video and the picture were with plaster all over the place. Now you're effectively just taking pictures. Um, for people who are interested, we can talk more about this, but there are a number of computational techniques that we use, including 3D reconstruction, including machine learning, you know, including biomechanics, um, software engines, um, and then including CAD, that's computer-aided design. If there are any questions about that, I'm happy to talk a lot more about that. And then the last step is to now build the actual device. And here we're using 3D printing, you know, we're using injection molding. There are a bunch of different manufacturing techniques that we're using as well. Um, now all this, like this slide is really a good summary, if you will, of my academic background as well, right? So all the skills needed to do these different things were acquired either through the mechanical engineering curriculum you know, the biomedical engineering curriculum, um, the postdoc, as well as just independent study, you would find that, you know, as a student, a lot of the things you end up using are things that you have to learn on your own. And even though the classroom, even in, in your discipline or your program, you get a lot of knowledge transferred, effectively, ultimately, you still have to do a lot of reading, a lot of studying, and a lot of engagement with the material. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and open up the the floor for for questions and discussions 
How are we doing on time, Carlene? It looks like we have 20 more minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get back to see if we have any questions. I know I have a question about, um, oh, so let's see. Someone said, do you try to match prosthetics to skin tone? That's a, that's a great question. And it's something that yes, we, we personally don't do that right now. Um, because it's not, it's not the specific area that we're working in, but yes, there's something called a prosthetic cover and a lot of manufacturers of prosthetic covers try to have the full blend. So it's almost like makeup, right? You try to make sure that you have the full range of skin tones. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people who use prosthetic devices and they report that they just feel more comfortable as I would if the prosthetic device that they're wearing matches the rest of their body, matches the skin tone. So it's one of the very important aspects of a design and observing what the problem is. So yes. Um, another question says, are certain types of limb loss more difficult to create prosthetics than others? That's another great question. So the way to think about it is that a prosthetic device is replacing functionality of a lost limb. And a lot of complexity is, like exists in your joints. So to answer that question, the way I would rephrase it is, you know, how many, like which prosthetic devices replace the most number of joints? So think about it this way that if a person has an amputation above their knee, then they've lost their knee joint and their ankle joint. So uh, an above knee an above knee prosthetic device is incredibly, it's significantly more complex than a below knee prosthetic device because a below knee prosthetic device, you're really only replacing the functionality of the ankle, right? So the more joints you have to replace functionality for, the more complex the device. I'm just, I feel like um, it, this is so interesting because as you just spoke about, when you think about how our, our, our joints are connected, it's just amazing that science, you know, and technology allows us to, to, to make it fit almost mm -hmm. and to have the functionality that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, and cool. just tying that back to a STEM education, I think that's really what's fascinating about a STEM education. It's that you have the toolkit to solve real problems. And, you know, it's not saying that other disciplines don't solve real problems, but depending on what your interests are, you know, STEM education is how you get the toolkits, how you get the information to solve those problems. So I, I am completely fascinated by how the body works, how people move, how we move, you know, forces and reactions. I just think it's really fascinating. I played a lot of sports and always thought in that, in that sense that, wow, what do I have to do to achieve this goal? What do I have to do, you know, to, you know, execute on whatever my objective is in sports and, and biomedical engineering was really a way that I was able to bridge my personal interests, you know, with my career. So someone asked, how long do you have to go to school to have a career in biomedical engineering? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so there are multiple paths. The one I went was to have an undergrad in mechanical engineering. And then I, you know, did biomedical engineering for graduate school. Um, there are alternate paths. Some people have an undergraduate just straight in biomedical engineering. And there's certain things that they can do right after undergrad. Um, other people might come from, like me, mechanical engineer or electrical engineering, and maybe they do a master's. So if you think of a standard, you know, maybe not standard, if you think of a typical four-year, um, you know, engineering curriculum, then the minimum length of time to answer that question would be four years. But then you can go from four years to eight years with a PhD and so on and so forth. But I would say at, at a minimum, probably about four years. 
So interesting. Um, so I did have a question related to, um, so I know you just mentioned your love of sports. When you were growing up and you were a younger kid, can you um, talk about, again, your experience with the sciences and technology? So I imagine that given your, your, your background um, and, I, I feel like there are, um, you know, culturally in Africa, a lot of parents who do want their kids to go into medicine or, you know, um, be engineers. So can you just talk about um, if you had any pre-exposure to STEM when you were um, young? Yeah, so I did have a lot of pre-exposure to STEM. And a lot of that came from my parents, but a lot of that just came from school as well. Um, I think the the lesson that I would probably want to share with the group is really, really more about curiosity than STEM specifically. Um, I had no clue what STEM was. I had no clue what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't really know much. Like I said, I mostly broke things, not so much put them back together. Um, but I think what my parents were able to do was to support my curiosities. So there were many things that I was curious about. And, you know, I always wanted to understand how things worked and how things, you know, were put together. And, you know, like a, I remember one of my favorite watches when I was a kid, I remember taking it apart to see what was inside. And of course, I couldn't start to dream of putting it back together so I could never wear it again. But you know, I think, I think that's really what I would want to impress on the students on the call that, you know, the things you're curious about are really, really important. And there are many different paths to take your curiosity today and convert it into a career, you know, later in the future, right? So, so I think if you're lucky enough to be exposed to STEM, like maybe your parents are engineers or you know, you're doing summer programs in STEM, that's really great and that's awesome. Um, but even if you're not, I think that really getting a very healthy relationship with your curiosity, the things you're curious about, and, you know, just read more about it. Like if you're curious about how things work or how things, you know, why is the sky blue? It's a question a bunch of little kids ask, you know, then, you know, then just find out more. And, you know, Wikipedia, there are a bunch of other resources that at least get you started with understanding how things work. And then you can kind of take that knowledge and then build on it. And, and honestly, at the end of the day, that's really what engineering is. That's what STEM is. It's just a bunch of people that are curious about many things, you know, with tools to now answer that curiosity. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. That all of that was so well said. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, and the region of reading and mm -hmm. you know doing research um, of your interests. Mm -hmm. So it looks like our last question. Oh no, there's um, uh, two more questions. So mm -hmm. someone said, "Are prosthetics difficult to clean or sanitize?" That's a great question. And it's great because it's something we're dealing with in our company right now. So uh -huh. when you think about the use of prostheses or prosthetic devices in different climates around the world, so we're developing a product that has global use cases or global implications. Um, so if you're developing a product for use in Nigeria or in a different, you know, like an African climate or a really warm um, climate versus a temperate climate, you have to think about what materials are we using, right? Is it breathable? Um, how easy is it to clean or sanitize? You know, like, you know, like how much do people sweat in that environment? You know, so those are things. And going back to the framework that we discussed, you know, those are the moments where as a designer or a technologist, you have to have empathy and a connection to the people who are going to use your device and make sure that your materials are selected appropriately, you know. So the answer, the simple answer is that yes, certainly um, prosthetic devices can be difficult to clean, um, but a lot of it depends on how it was designed in the, in the first in the first case. And then um, the other question is, 
how long does it take on average to create a prosthetic limb? Yeah, the video did a really good job of summarizing that number. Um, on average, it takes about 20, like, I would say about a day, a full day. Um, some of that time is waiting time because, you know, you have things that need to set. So it's, there's a molding process where you use either molten plastic or plaster, and then it has to like harden and it might take four hours to harden or set. Um, but, you know, overall, on average, it takes about, you know, maybe, maybe 40 hours. I think uh, a prosthetist would reasonably say that, oh yeah, it took us 40 hours to build this entire device. The hands-on time was about a day, but the overall time was about 40 hours. Um, for the patient or the user of the device, a lot of times what that means is they have to come multiple times because imagine if they come to test the device and it doesn't fit, it's uncomfortable or it hurts them in a particular area, then a lot of times that process starts over. So that clock starts over. So so yeah, so I'd say I'd say a day and our goal as a company is to reduce that to about six to eight hours. Cool. So it looks like um, that was all of the questions. Um, definitely the response was wow. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do have one last question. Um, so, two, well, it's two in one. In general, anybody who is interested in biomedical engineering, um, what do you suggest some of the things that they do? And since summer is about to start, what are things that they can do in the summer that they have all these, you know, extra free time mm -hmm. that they can do to explore their curiosity Sorry. in biomedical engineering? That's a great question. And I wish you had like given me a heads up because I could have had like a <laughs> bunch of specific resources. But what I'll do is I'll I'll probably send no Carling resources, just it's just you know. Just your advice, like fair. if you were talking to a teen in front of you, impromptu, y'all having a burger and fries, and they're asking. Fair, fair. So yeah. the thing that I <laughs> deeply, deeply believe, it's called informational interviews, and it's uh, it's essentially like a reverse interview. So usually you're interviewing to get a job, and you know you're the person. So you know, let's say. You know, Carling's interviewing me to get a job, you know, at Semlink. Then, you know, I'm like, hey, this is what I can do. This is what I've done in the past. But an informational interview is a reverse interview where I'm interviewing maybe both of you and asking you, you know, what's the experience of your role? You know, what does it feel like? What, what, what's the, what's your daily experience in starting, you know, a foundation, um, starting a business, you know, in, you know, developing STEM curriculum in managing students. So I think that anyone who, and this doesn't just apply to biomedical engineering, honestly, it applies to any interest that people have for their career. Um, please reach out to professionals in the field and just ask them that, hey, can I schedule a half hour with you? To just learn more about what you do, you know, and a lot of us, you know, most of our meetings are quite you know, boring or retired. Like most people are so excited to speak to high school students and to, you know, kind of express the experiences that we've had. So it's more likely that you would get a yes than a no, even though you might have to go through multiple people to get that yes. So I always, always recommend informational interviews um, I do informational interviews when I'm starting a new project, you know, when I'm starting a new thing. I'm like, you know, I just, you know, send people emails on LinkedIn and just ask them that, hey, do you mind if I take about 20 or 30 minutes of your time? I'll just like to learn more about what you do and your experience with that. So so that that is always my number one, you know, recommendation for anyone that has an interest in a, in a career path. Okay. And some one last question. Okay, so you said you broke a lot of stuff. 
Um, <laughs> when I grew up, my mom was like, break it if you want to. This is your first and last one. So if people, kids have parents like my mom who mm -hmm. can't break stuff because it won't be replaced, how do they get that same experience from breaking stuff and putting it together without breaking stuff? Um, so notice that together. I never said it got replaced. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's no claim. There's no claim that it gets replaced, right? Okay. So it's really about the like engaging with that curiosity. And I mean, my parents were the same way. Well, you broke it. You know, sucks for you, Shaney. That's kind of how it went, you know. But, you know, it wasn't ever this idea that, oh, yeah, we'll just get a new one or we'll just replace it. We just, I was raised like that, not even close, you know. Um, <laughs> but what we did do was to start, you know, kind of read. So I, I'll, I'll give this example, you know. We used to have, I remember when we got a remote control car. Oh, my God, I wanted a remote control car so badly. Like, that was the one thing that I believed if I ever got a remote control car, it would change my life as a kid, you know? And eventually, you know, years later, years later, I got one. And I remember that it, I don't know how it happened, but we ended up taking out the motors from the car, just to take out the motors on the wheel. And, you know, of course we couldn't put it back together again, but we ended up, you know, taking the styrofoam that comes in packages, I remember we filled up the bathtub with water and then, you know, like shaped out a boat and then made like some tiny little like plastic propellers and then used the motors to like just propel a boat. Now we had like a remote control boat because we couldn't fix it on the car, you know. So there were just little things. And, you know, I am definitely a believer that, you know, you design within constraints. And this is actually how engineering works, right? If you if you give me an infinite budget, you give me X amount of money, it doesn't mean I'm going to come up with a better design, right? So the skill of engineering is knowing how to use the little things we have to create an experience that we're trying to target, right? So, so yeah, I, I don't think the ask would be that we get things replaced. I think if there are any parents on the call, I would recommend that, you know, they, they're they gentle with their kids if they break things. That's very different from needing to replace things. But, hey, if you broke it, it's yours and figure out what you want to do with it, you know. And and I think for a lot of kids and a, a lot of us and certainly for me, it was, it was just figuring out, okay, what can I do now? I want to play with something and I only have pieces of a thing. What do I do now? <laughs> you know, so that's that's kind of the attitude. And honestly, I've worked in places that have very small budgets and places that have large budgets. And I do think that you have a higher skill as an engineer when you know how to work within constraints. You know, so I really believe that. So. Well, thank you so much. So before we go, Carlin is going to say how we're going to engage. Um, people this summer um, and then, you know, close up the cafe, wrap up the cafe. We learned so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah, this like, a lot of fun. Like I said, I knew this was going to be a really awesome one. Um, and so um, while we won't be having our Teen Science Cafes um, or STEM in the Cities uh, for the summer, we do do Instagram takeovers on our Instagram page. And so we will continue to um, host those and have young people who are um, really stepping up and being um, STEM leaders already, showing a lot of passion for STEM um, as our uh, takeovers for the summer. We also will be launching a program uh, really soon where uh, called TikTok STEM, where you will be able to learn how to communicate STEM on social media. Uh, and so those are the two things that you guys can look out for from SimLink for the summer. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in, whether you have watched us live or whether you're watching us on our YouTube channel. And we hope you learn so much about biomedical engineering and that a few of you become future biomedical engineers because we need you to solve problems that help us with our everyday lives. 
Thank you for joining us. Good night. Thank you.